Hi, everyone, and welcome to Pushing the Limits. Today, I have a very, very special guest. I actually don't know how you found time in your day because uh, the, 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 your bio is pretty long. Dr. Dane Goodnow, welcome to our show, Pushing the Limits. It's fantastic to have you here today. Thank you, Lisa. Happy to be here. <laughs> um, you are a neuroscientist, a synthetic biochemist, the founder of Prodrome Sciences. You're also the author of Breaking Alzheimer's. Uh, you produce a product that I have my mum on, um, and it has been a, a, a big part of her recovery. Um, and uh, so I'm very, very excited to meet you. Uh, let's come from Dr. Elizabeth Hewitt. Shout, uh, yes, shout out to her. Thanks for uh, putting me on to uh, Dr. Dayan's work. Um, so I'm very, very excited today. First, before we jump into the, the science and the amazing stuff that you do, can you give us a little bit of a background, Doctor, on, on what you have done in the past and who, where you come from? Yeah, like it's really kind of an organic process. Like my first training is in synthetic organic chemistry. And then I went into uh, medicine looking at the neurochemistry, like the biochemical mechanisms of neurological disease. And one thing leads to another and you start trying to figure things out. And sometimes the tools are there, like you make available, you know, you make use of tools that you have, but as a chemist and biochemist and the genetic revolution was occurring where people were looking, there's a gene for this and a gene for that, um, which is really not true. And the, the genetics that we use for say plant breeding or animal husbandry, that's not the same as what really happens inside the cells of your body. And so what there wasn't, but we had this ability to massively sequence the entire genome of organisms and look at how this was working. But we didn't have that same type of technology at the biochemical level. We couldn't actually measure the totality of the biochemical response. And if you wanna know how a gene functions, you wanna understand what the biochemical consequences of that genetic expression is. And so I, my first invention was this complex non-targeted analysis it allows us to measure thousands and thousands of molecules simultaneously. Wow. And once you do that, you get a true representation of phenotype, whether it's the human phenotype or whether it's in a cell culture or an animal study. And when this was, as we started applying this to human epidemiology, we started, the first concept obviously was saying, hey, wow, you know, if I can see, here's a person with colon cancer and here's a person that's normal, well, if I can physically see a difference between these two people, there has to be a biochemical difference between them, right? Mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, it's just logic. And so if I'm not seeing a biochemical difference, I'm not looking hard enough to mm -hmm. find that difference. And this technology allowed me to do that. And sure enough, we could diagnose virtually anything, okay? Colon, pancreatic, you name it, we can differentiate diseases. Bipolar versus schizophrenia versus unipolar depression, understand the understanding the basic of it. And so the first concept was this, this idea of diagnostics. Mm -hmm. And then as you get into it, like, you know, when it's a scientist, it's kind of like a complex crossword puzzle. You just, <laughs> part of it, part of it's a fun, you know, I'll, I'll just like, you get kind of immersed in it as almost like a game in a sense. And so we, so we find these biomarkers that change in colon cancer. And we thought, well, that's great. Now let's do a study. And if we, cure the colon cancer, tumor removal, that the biomarkers should come back to normal, right? Yep, yep. Didn't happen. Right. Biomarkers uh -huh. exactly the same. Okay, so we did the study in, in uh, the first study was done in Osaka, Japan, with after, because like, the diagnostic test is great. It, it measures 85, 90% sensitivity for colon cancer at stage zero. Wow. So, and simple blood test. And so, so we did this study in, in uh, Osaka and thinking we're so smart, we had this all figured out. This is gonna be, wow, this is a blockbuster. We're gonna see, look at these markers, they're so low. And when the tumor is removed, the marker is gonna come back up to normal and we're gonna be famous. But <laughs> no, what happened was that tumor removal, the biomarkers stayed exactly the same. So what the hell? <laughs> and so we redid the entire study over again in Chiba University, the other side of Japan, basically, exactly the same results. And wow. that was really the first mindset of saying, you know, disease is a symptom. Yeah, of the environment. So the, the, yeah, the concept was that the mindset is that the disease causes the biochemical change. But in fact, it's 
biochemical dysfunction that ends up causing disease. Mm -hmm. So, and then over many, many years after, as we continue to dig into this stuff, you start understanding that health is a singularity. Your health, my health, your children's health, your parents' health. Health is health. Health is the same for all of us. That's a, a number one from a Pythagorean per perspective, right? And then you get a deviation from that health. And that deviation becomes more and more complex as you come down the, the pathway. And so these diseases that we get focused on are ultimately deviations from health, but they're symptomatic. And they are, you know, obviously when you get a pathological state, like you have a, a tumor tumor, right? It's physically there. You can't deny its existence. But the question really is, is why? Mm. You know, why did you get ovarian mm. cancer and your sister did not? Okay, what, what's, what's different? What, why, and so what set it up? And a lot of it comes down to the, the, you know, kind of the old, I use a ball tire analogy, right? Like a ball tire increases your risk of getting a flat tire, but it doesn't guarantee you a risk. Like you could have, so a ball tire is a risk for a flat tire mm -hmm. and you can drive. And if you drive on bad roads, that risk gets accelerated and you have a higher probability. It's a great but just because you have a brand new set of tires, a brand new set of tires doesn't mean you're completely free from a flat tire. You just need to get, you know, if you get a sharp enough nail hitting you in just the right place, even the best tire in the world is going to get a flat. Okay. But, you know, the odds are, you know, the good nice. tire versus the flat tire. And then medicine, as we practice it, we take these ball tires, we get a flat, and then we just patch the ball tire and put the ball tire back on the road again. Right. And so it's so, and so the, so why people with colon cancer or breast cancer, after they've been cured, they still have a much, much higher incidence rate versus people who have never had those cancers in the first place. So what you, what medicine basically does, it just resets the clock. So it does it. So it, it takes the pathological process and puts it, puts the ball tire back on the road, but it doesn't deal with the reason why that one person got that cancer in the first place. Mm -hmm. And this applies not just to this colon cancer or breast cancer or pancreatic cancer or even ovarian cancer. That's another pet peeve of mine. Like, we, you know, that should never happen. Yep. And then, the, but when you get to dementia and other aspects. So these, and that leads to this concept of a prodrome. So you have a health state. You enter a risk state, mm -hmm. and that risk state can last for ten minutes, or it can last for ten years. Okay, it all depends upon what other triggers happen. Same autism is a good example, right? Autism yeah. was a disease that was extremely rare in the yeah. 40s, 50s. You had one child, and say 100,000 or 200,000 have autism. Yep. We have five percent of the males in uh, Scotland get autism. Have yeah. autism. It's a ridiculous number, and we don't actually. It used to be a neurodevelopmental disorder, which meant the child was born with a defect and typically a mitochondrial defect. But nowadays, you know, children are born with risk and then a triggering event occurs. So our environment is far, far more riskier yeah. than it has been. Yeah. And so we end up having this environmentally induced disease that's masquerading as an old developmental disease. Wow, so, so when you start looking at this, and so then as you start looking at as a biochemist, I'm saying, okay, you know, and we did all these big, long studies. And actually, today's a very happy day for me. I have, I just received 6,000, no, 9,000 blood samples from Russia University today. Wow. Um, <laughs> they're longitudinal studies. So, but, um, and I've been waiting six years for them. So I'm pretty wow. very, Okay. Uh, you must have been really excited. Yeah. I'm very, very excited today. So, but what happens then is that, so I've done all these huge studies for many, many years, but it's kind of a morbid life because you sit in this glass tower watching people live and die yeah right and you're really intervening and the real real kick in the pants is that you deserve this it's this implementation phase in medicine that becomes yeah. so hard to overcome oh god but we have knowledge <laughs> yeah right there isn't a lack of knowledge there's a lack of ability to implement it like uh, i cancer. mean and so uh, you know, basically I get out of that glass tower and I roll my sleeves up now and we say, okay, let's deal with real people. And so now we can, we, we make these biochemical intermediates of human biochemistry. It's, it's basically treating the human body like a brewery. Okay. Yep. If you want wheat taste in beer and wine, you got to feed it properly. It's got the right things in the right proportion. And the, you know, your lifestyle, we talk about exercise and this and that, 
because you, the human body is, has to live. It's like a shark has to swim or it dies, right? The human body must be active. Okay, you can't lie in bed. You can't say, oh, I'm going to lie in bed. I'm going to have the perfect mixture of oxygen and I'm going to have an IV giving me the exact perfect nutrition. No, we well, need both. You're going to turn into mush. Like you're just, <laughs> you're going to turn into like a bowl of soup. You, like you're, so the physics, there's, there's this give and take, push and pull system that we must be husbandry of it. Like we must look yeah. at that and say, how do we manage our physiology and then look at these things and identify like and so we get away from this disease concept yes. okay find the disease kill the disease kind of yeah. concept right yeah where it's rather saying here's health like i don't need my engine to run out of oil and seize to say oh i guess i should have put some oil in it like <laughs> i i think we should have a little bit of forethought and say you know i don't have to wait for the symptom to occur Love it. to interact like i should be able to say this is what it's supposed to be like brain volume, like it's same lot of the MRI imaging and a lot of stuff we do. It's all about, okay, I'm 85. How do I compare to another 85 year old? Do I have a bigger no. brain? Well, <laughs> like, what's the point? Like, it, yeah, should exactly. be it should be a healthy brain. It doesn't matter what how old you are. It should yes. be working. Um, it shouldn't be. So that's my other pet peeve. Is it's yeah, me too. I, it's like, it's like okay for your like age. A, it's like a, it's like a high school competition, you know. Oh, how old are you? Are you know? It's a, it's, I don't know. So it's kind of, it kind of gets to me after a while. Yeah, yeah. Because, because it gets into a different conversation where, but you know, humans are humans. Like we have, like we live to compete, right? Like that's yep. and as long too. as as long as it's fun, and, you know, like it's, and and it pushes us to do better, which is always good. So that, so that's, that's how that's how this all came. Into then, uh, we, so you've you've, we, you've basically gone. I've I've been studying and researching and doing all these amazing things, and now I want to get some of this amazing information that's inside my head and make it into products that can actually help people who are dealing with actual diseases. Um, yeah, and, and this is and a, it's this is selfish because it's, it's my it's my own laboratory. Like I take all this stuff. Like I make it for myself. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's so, so I have to make enough. <laughs> So, uh, you know, because it's, it's just, you know, it's, in, you know, you can't just make it in a kitchen. We need some technology to do it. So, yeah. um, so now I have my plasmalogens every day and I have my, my individual supplements that I need. And, and some of the stuff, you know, obviously there's so many super cheap things out there that are really, really valuable. And that's the other problem. All these supplements become commoditized. Yeah. Like cre creatine, like everyone over 50, 50, 60 should be young. Like it's the biggest thing to prevent muscle wasting and sarcopenia in the elderly. Like it's just ridiculous. It's and it's so cheap and easy to get. Oh, it's like <laughs> it comes in a bucket. And um, yeah. Is it, so it's, is it, is creatine, oh, I just wanted to ask you on that one. Like, like um, you know, having dealt with mums with, with a cancer, uh, is something like creatine okay to put in the mix? You know, like, because there's a lot of things with cancer and this was a question that I had around the plasmologens as well, plasmologens, I keep saying that wrong, right. um, the, when it comes to cancer models, um, are they safe to put in the mix? Because things like, um, you know, phosphatidylcholine, uh, which is really important for brain health, um, you know, uh, important molecule there, um, there's some research around it not being great to put into a, with someone with cancer. So, you know, like uh, what, what's, what's logically good for somebody who's healthy isn't always logically good for someone who has a cancer. Um, and that's been a bit of a like, for, for me, a shift in, you know, mindset about, in the last year. It's about timing. Okay. It's about timing. Okay. So the classic concept of cancer is a titration event. Okay. How do I get a therapeutic window? How do I give a human being just enough toxin that it's going to selectively kill the cancer cells, but not the other cells. So there's this yeah. therapeutic yes. window concept, right? And there's a certain degree of validity to that. But the other part is cancers are actually healthy cells, right? They're, 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 they're amazingly healthy. They're, they're, over -healthy. They're, very, very, they're very, very selfish. Yeah. Okay? They, don't, yeah. they don't play well, they play with, well. With, with their community. But cancer needs to be contained. Okay. So cancer needs, cancer is like a, it has to commandeer the following cell and says, Hey, look how great I am. Why don't you be a cancer cell too? And let me teach you how to be a cancer cell. And then that one teaches another cancer cell. And, and so, so part of cancer is containment. 
So in terms of ca reducing cancer, strengthening the cells around the cancer will shrink the cancer. Okay, the cancer oh, wow. has no place to go, right? And so, so you, it's, a, it's a combination. So if you wanna do a chemotoxic process, do that for a period of time, say, okay, you know what? I'm not going to feed the cancer. I'm not gonna feed the healthy cells. I'm going to get the chemotoxic agent, let it do its short-term activity, and then feed the rest of the cells, N-acetylcysteine, carnitines, co uh, CoQ10, your phosphocholine, the plasmalogen, because now what you want to do is you've, you've hit the cancer and now you want to contain it. And oh, you, wow. want to, you, want to, you want to strengthen everything around it because oh. if the cancer can't grow, your cells will kick it out. We oh, all, that's just blowing my mind. Because we all have you, cancer right you, now. You, you and I saying, have cancer right now. You, you're okay. saying that it's about the timing. So you have a kill phase. So you're going yes. in with a kill phase with chemo, hyperbaric, vitamin C, whatever, off-label drug yeah. combinations, whatever you've chosen as your pathway. Yeah. And then when um, when you've gone through that kill phase, like with mum, we've got a clear MRI now. Because um, I've been you know, debating... This and this is the tightrope that you walk when you when you're working with someone with cancer is you know you're trying you're, to feed the person nourish the person give the person the right nutrients while not feeding the tumor <laughs> and it's this yeah. bloody tightrope <laughs> and of course a lot of uh, cancer patients are you know, and they, they're losing weight and so the general uh, oncologists that you go to in the hospital are telling you to eat your pudding and have lots of lots of energy have your sugar you know and I'm like. No, uh, <laughs> fasting. Yeah, okay. fasting so, is much better. <laughs> a fasting, a fasting cell cannot be cancerous. Yes. Okay. okay, a cancerous cell, by definition, is a cell that's lost its ability to function in the fasting state. Okay, that is what is a cancer cell, and that's why low HDL drives cancer, low plasmalogens drive cancer. Um, so, so what happens is, you see, cancer cells don't want to be cancer cells, okay? They're forced to become cancer cells. They can't survive without being cancerous cells, okay? So they, 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 they have learned, they're trying to survive, okay? They lost their ability to, to maintain its, their own homeostasis under regular biochemistry, so typically the the brachygene. Yeah. So they've now taught themselves to, to they, 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 they reconfigure their, their mm -hmm. the, Citric the acid fermentation cycle. process. Okay. Yeah. And and they the proxosomal function goes down, mitochondrial function goes up. And so they've been able to learn to live in a in a non-fasting state. And so that's what the BRCA gene does. So so for women with breast cancer, the BRCA mutation prevents them from maintaining a fasting state. Okay. And then eventually the cell says, hey, if I don't get sugar, I'm going to die. Yeah. So I, I had to find a way to upregulate my sugar or I will die. So it's not that they want sugar or glucose, is that if they don't get glucose, they die. And so think people think that there's some sort of protagonistic approach to it, but it's not. It is actually adaptive. Cancer mm -hmm. cells are adaptive. Okay. A cancer does not become cancer, it adapts to become cancer as its only survival option under the circumstances. So so health, so I always tell people, look, let the surgeon cut the cancer. Your job is to recover from surgery. Okay, you need to recover from the chemo. And it's it's because it's the recovery phase that gives you your good prognosis long-term. Mm -hmm. We're pretty good at killing cancer. We're pretty good at cutting cancer out. We're not so good at recovering from that work. Yeah. Okay, and that's the problem. Um, so that kind of two-phase approach um, and then so the peroxome, so the, the mitochondria become anabolic as opposed to being catabolic exactly. uh, when they're in that cancer state, and the peroxome um, starts to. So you, you're not getting that building up phase, that recovery. You're not producing the HDLs and the the correct because the if plasmalogens the, and so on. Because the peroxome is your typical anabolic organelle. So okay, so when you when you're in the human body is designed to live in the fasting state. We only eat to put ourselves back in the fasting state. Okay. Wow. Purpose of eating is to go into the fasting state. Okay. So, so fasting is very similar digestion of your fat cells versus your gut. 
So when you eat a meal, you're in the fed state, but your gut is digesting food and supplies and it's coming in. It's a, it's, it's a rush to the body. You say, there's no way I can process all this energy. So it ships the excess energy in the form of triglycerides into your fat cells. Mm -hmm. And later on, similar enzymes, lipases, digest the fat in your fat cells and send free fatty acids out. So you're basically replacing your stomach with your fat cells, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. adipose tissue. And so when you're doing a keto diet or you're doing these kind of diets, what they're fasting, how they're considered fasting mimetics is because they're, they're treating the gut like an adipose tissue cell. So the same type of molecules coming out of the gut from a is high fat diet so. is, is identically to what would normally be coming out of it. Uh -huh. And so your body thinks and feels it's getting free fatty acid and, and so on. So that free fatty acid is your energy. It goes into your cells. And then you have two parts of your cells that process it. One is your mitochondria and one is your peroxisome. Like you said, mitochondria catabolic. It's supposed to be just pure energy. Fatty acids go in, get digested to acetyl-CoA, because we're, we're essentially a hybrid electric car. We burn hydrocarbons to charge a battery. And the battery is in the mitochondria. And so what happens then in cancer is that instead of that fatty acid metabolism going to charge the, the electron transport chain gradient, like the battery, mm -hmm. okay, part of, part of it gets cut out called citrate. And it goes yep. out and then that becomes your building phase. And that's how it builds cholesterol. So cholesterol misregulation is a huge issue. Probably the biggest issue for cancer is cholesterol dysregulation. Well, I've and never then, heard that before. Yeah, that's all cancer is caused by can cholesterol membrane related wow. issues. Wow. And so, so the citrate, yeah, there's, and we've known this for years and years, but it, it's, people don't talk about it. So uh. it's cholesterol in your membranes that deal with it. So that's why HDL, people with have high HDL levels have a very low risk of, colon ca of any cancer. So wow. HDL, and that's why your phospholcholine prevents pancreatic cancer, for example. All pancreatic cancers are derived from choline deficiencies. So does, anyway, it, does, so, it, yeah, does it switch alliances, though, when you have, actually have now a cancer of cell? Does those things that would actually be beneficial then switch alliances? You know, like I've been, uh, you know, some of the research around coenzyme Q10 and... Um, uh, acetylcarnitine and um, uh, phosphocholine, uh, phosphatidylcholine um, as being not good to put in the mix um, well, when, so you, when you've got a cancer cell. But you're saying it's, it's declining. Yeah. And because you, it, you don't, the overall health of the body is going to have the greatest impact on cancer shrinkage. Got it. Like, yeah. So, because, like, so if you're, if you're hitting the cancer, it's if you if if the you have to what's what's the point of killing a cancer shrinking the cancer if you've left a whole bunch of damage left and so now now what's going to fill in the hole again the cancer is going to fill the hole back up okay right. so you need to be you need to be able to fill the space um, with healthy cells and so you, so and so that's why wow. thing is that we we all have cancer the dip, the yeah. concept of cancer is when it gets to a certain cell mass that we can actually see it. Mm -hmm. And it gets to a certain level that it, it, it learns to create its own um, blood supply mm. and we can actually see it. But fundamentally, cancer is just an aberrantly growing cell. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. probably, a million, probably a million times a day, you have a cancerous type cell in your body. And it, but it, doesn't go, it has no place to go, okay? It's like having a bad, you know, you know if you, as long as you don't have one bad neighbor on your street, it, it kind of stays, you know, eventually the person says, it's no fun here. I'm going to go you know, somewhere like, else where, where my bu bunch of other bad people are. Okay. And, but, but as soon as you get five or six, then all of a sudden the whole neighborhood goes to hell. Yeah. Right. And so, and so what you want to have is you want to have that one guy that's a, you know, the get pain kicked out by the, by the healthy ones. Well, and you're, good you, ones. you want to make it inhospitable for him. It says, you know, yeah. Right. So he says, well, I don't like it here. Like there's no, I got no, no peeps here. So I'm going to eventually leave this neighborhood to find another neighborhood that I want to harass. And so that's so, kind of what cancer cells like. So when you have a, um, um, you know, like, it, like with mum, we've now gotten rid of the cancer. According to the MRI, there's nothing on the resolution there. So we've, we've gotten rid of the bigger tumors. They're gone. Um, but we've got white matter 
uh, damage in the in the brain without, and I'll, I won't butcher the science because I don't understand yeah. all neuroscience, but I know that there's problems in thinning of the corpus callosum, um, and we've got some damage from the from the uh, temozolomide that we put in the mix, presumably. Um, this is a good phase then to come in stronger with things like the plasmalogens and, and that to come in and actually rebuild yeah, the down. power of that brain. Yeah, so see, the human brain, when it develops, the development process of the human brain is myelination. Okay, that's how, so people think, hey, the brain is like a computer, but it's not. The brain is like a wiring harness, okay? And it has a pipe of wires and the corpus callosum is that main pipe that connects the hemispheres. But, and it, so it's like the pipe of wires going from the front of your car to the back of your car, for example, yeah. right? And then they get to the end and they spread out. Mm -hmm. But during the, in the pipe, what, protects those, what allows you to put all those neurons in one tight bundle is the myelination, the mm -hmm. protective coating around the wires. And that what allows signal to go long distances. And then they connect at the ends to another neuron, just like your light switch on your wall type of thing. Makes sense. And so, so now, but what happens when you get age-related degeneration or cancer-related degeneration, it kind of goes backwards. Okay, so the remyelination now gets the um, it kind of it that's one of the first places that get shrunken and it, it becomes um cannibalized, if you will, because there wow. are uh membrane nutrients, plasmalogens, especially that white matter is like 75% plasmalogen. It's it's almost all plasmalogen. So when you're a newborn baby, like a newborn baby coming right out of the womb has like the brain is like seven percent plasmalogen. Like it's very little plasmalogen because they're not myelinating. By year two, it's 50% plasmalogens in the brain. Like this is like, that's, that, that's how much massive, the, how nerve cells grow. So when you have nerve damage, okay, there's always two parts of it. One is the protective coating because you need to have a protective coating so that the signal can get through. Yeah, absolutely. Once the, signal, get once the signal gets through, it yep. can, it's like a, it's it can start having a conversation you can and do its job yep and once it reinforces a conversation then it starts that in, that that activity begets more activity and it starts and starts the reinforcement process so, this, so that, would, this would also have impact like i'm working with people with motor neurons disease as well um oh, absolutely. and yeah. yeah so do you uh, you know the myelin sheaths and um even people with dealing with um you know, uh, stress and burnout and and things like that, and where the nervous system is completely, you know, <laughs> mine, for example, yeah. <laughs> stressed well, out. The, the whole inflammation <laughs> that whole, process that must be affecting it, huh? Yeah, inflammation but, really affects white matter badly, and it's wow. it, it's like creating static on your radio. Okay, all of a sudden the signal is just staticky, and then, but you can still kind of hear the music if the music is low. Right, but if it's too high, all you hear is noise and static, yeah. right? And so when you have an autoimmune or you have this neuromuscular issue, as long as things are kind of on the low, calm, you can kind of get through, but any kind of extra stress, all you get is noise. And so that is the tuning process. That's kind of the white matter process. And so once you get the white matter tuned, once you get your station tuned, then you can crank the volume up as high as you want because you got the signal signal um, is is clean. And so these white matter diseases, like say even autoimmune type, like multiple sclerosis or autism, these are, when you have the immune system overactivated, it really damages that. It's like a bunch of mice chewing on your wires in the wall. They just wow. kind of, they reduce that signal connectivity. And then people get pain, they get anxiety, they get, and so the glia, the, the omega-9 plasmalogen really is involved in that. So people for sleep improvement, Certainly lung, like for people with long COVID or, or lung related issues, the omega-9 plasmalogen really restores lung function. So if you have wow. ALS, right, and you're mostly pulmonary um, dysfunction, that's usually a neuromuscular part of, the, yep. of their lungs. Um, but, and then the proteome neuro, which is the omega-3, that deals with the neuromuscular junction and the synapse. So you have two parts, like you have, so all your neurological systems have the wiring pipe, and then you have the switching plate, which is called a synapse. And you have a different type of um, plasmalogen coating them. So the so people that have, you know, anxiety and sleep disorders, and where your brain can't just turn, you just can't turn your brain off, right? Like it's just like it's just 
wired. Yeah, yeah. That that is what it's inflammation. It's 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 neurological inflammation. Even if you just can't put your finger on it. So and all so of these diseases yeah. seem to have a you know um, common denominators, don't they? In the in in the common de denominator of all of them is inflammation. Is that word inflammation? Is a neuroinflammation? It seems to be the common yeah. denominator that's causing all of these things, and that can be addressed by plasmalogens. And mitochondrial support. And, okay, and the yeah, so NAC, carnitine, and, N-acetylcysteine, yeah. CoQ10, those are the big ones. And then we forget about our basic B vitamins. Like, so you want to double check like your you know, transfers, B1, yeah. B2, and B3. So uh, uric acid is a good measurement in the blood. Like most people are worried about high mm. uric acid for gout, but really yeah. low uric acid is much, much more dangerous. Like you want to keep your uric acid above five. Really? Um, okay. Yeah, as soon as it gets below five, you're in an NAD deficiency. And most Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, all of these neurological diseases, they all have low NAD. And so and low, low uric acid. Okay. That, so, uh, so the NAD piece of that puzzle, because uh, like I take um, nicotinamide mononucleotide all the time as a precursor to the NAD. So is that uh, affected by that? Uh, yeah, so NAD is kind of a red herring in a sense. Your body, any your body doesn't use NAD for anything. Okay, so and so NAD is um, is you, it's NADH is what the body uses. Okay, mm -hmm. human elect human electricity is NADH. H so when you burn yeah. hydrocarbon, okay, so when you take a just like your car engine, you blow you know, put octane in your car and it turns into carbon dioxide and water, that releases energy. And that in, in your car, it, it goes boom, you get gas, you get gas formation and it drives your piston. In the human, of course, that doesn't happen. Otherwise we just burst and flame, <laughs> right? And so, so it happens, the same amount of energy gets released. When, so when, when, when your mitochondria or your peroxisomes break one of these hydrocarbon bonds and the energy from that bond gets released, that energy goes on, onto NADH. Gotcha. Okay. NAD picks it up, but the NAD gets a proton to get NADH, but it also picks up electrons. Now that now becomes electricity hmm. and it is not reversible. Okay. So when you when you create NADH in your body, it must get used. Your body it, it has no place to go. And where it's supposed to go is your electron transport chain in your mitochondria. And that proton goes to create the battery gradient, just like your lead battery, but instead of lead, we use protons. And then the electron on NADH gets transferred onto CoQ10. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so NADH puts it onto CoQ10 and then it goes through the electron transport chain. And then that converts oxygen into water. And you now have a ATP pump. So your electric, your electrical engine drives your ATP pump. Now, what happens is if your body is burning fat or anything, and it the NADH, the body can't process NADH. So this NADH builds up, okay? Like if you're mitochondrially insufficient and this NADH, when it builds up, the cell says, holy crap, I'm gonna die here. And so it starts spitting the electrons out of the cell into extracellular space. You get super mm -hmm. oxidized. And that's oxidative stress. So any, so, and when your uric acid gets high, that's an indicator that your body cannot, has too much NADH. It's processing, it, it's, it, you're, you you're can't- too much energy in that you can't cell. Energy. And then you'll, and you'll see your triglycerides will get over hundred when that happens and those type of things, or your cholesterol will start dripping, dropping under 200. Um, those are big measures that your cellular health is, is impaired. Wow. So yeah, so the NAD, so, so you don't want to be NAD deficient, and good old fashioned niacin. So any, like, so when you take an NAD plus IV injection, it's kind of a, it's an electron sponge is what it does. Okay, NAD plus comes in and just, if there's any extra electrons around, it just kind of sucks them up. It'll, yeah, yeah. It, but, but remember when you take NAD plus, okay, it's getting converted to NADH, okay? That's what, it's, that's, that, that's what you're, you're taking. So good old fashioned niacin is usually nicotinic acid um, and some branch chain amino acids are usually really powerful at improving that functionality. So, so if you have low uric acid, if you get a blood test and your uric acid is in the fours, um, usually you're NAD deficient. And wow. the best way to fix that is with 
unless you're taking high dose vitamin C, there's some, there's some things that can complicate the test, but it's a really simple crude test and it, it solves a lot of people's problems. Crikey. And this is, um, um, yeah, doing blood chemistry course with Dr. Youth at the moment. And you know, <laughs> it's just amazing what, um, how much information you can get out of a basic blood test, you know, a $10. Yeah. Well, again, like a lot of these things have these U-shaped curves, right? Yeah. And we all think of the bad side, like creatinine, for instance, people think, you know, your, your, your kidney filtration rate. Yep. So if you have high creatinine, you could have kidney disease. And so everybody focuses on high creatinine. Well, that's not the problem for 99% of the people. The problem is low creatinine. So as soon as your creatinine gets below one, certainly down below eight, you're in muscle wasting space. Your body can't, is not making enough creatine. And so, and people have high, like you'll find people that have high homocysteine and they've been fighting their whole life to get this homocysteine down. They're saying, I'm taking my B12, I'm taking my methylfolate, I'm taking blah, blah, blah. And whatever I do, I can't get my homocysteine down. Well, you just give them creatine and it'll come down because wow. creatine is like, the two main contributors to your homocysteine levels is making creatine for your muscles and making phosphocholine for your brain and membranes. And so if you provide those two in your diet, if you get enough of them in your diet, then your body has this reserve capacity. And so you, you free up this methyl transfer system for other things. And because homocysteine wow. is basically a measure of that. Yeah, around. cardiovascular risk and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. I've been dealing with that very same thing. You know, after the after the chemo with mum, her homocysteine levels started to rise. I went, oh, got to got to methylate her more, get more methyl donors in B twelve, B nine. Uh, brought it down to a certain degree, but I need to put creatine. Yeah, because like remember, stuff. homocysteine you, you can trick the homocysteine. Homocysteine is a very valuable biomarker because yeah. it tells you the rate of methyltransferase. Okay, it's, 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 it's a measure of how active it is. So it itself is not a toxic molecule. Okay? There's nothing toxic about homocysteine. It's a biomarker. It's like your gas gauge on your car. It just tells you something else is going on. Mm -hmm. But if you trick it, like if you take these high doses, you can bring your homocysteine down, but I call it the leaky boat syndrome. It's like having a beautiful boat with a big hole in the hull. And you're just having, you're, you're pumping the water up faster than it's coming in and you're looking at the boat and say, wow, this doesn't look great. Yep. And so yeah. a lot of the homocysteine lowering, all you're doing is increasing the recycling rate of homocysteine, uh -huh. but you're not actually addressing the underlying issue is why is it elevated in the first place? And what, why is the body unable or doing too much methyltransferase? So if you give creatine and phosphocholine, you lower homocysteine levels naturally because what you've done now is you You've just replaced it. So your body makes about three to four grams of creatine every day for your muscles, but also for your brain. People forget what cre creatine is really an important, like we talk about people who use it for muscle weight building and mm. all that stuff. Yeah. But for everybody yeah. else, two to three, two, four, between two and four grams a day is what you should be taking because that's what you're making generally. And all you're doing, if you give yourself the creatine in your diet, that's two to three grams that your liver does not have to make. Okay, your kidney wow. makes the first half, your liver makes the second half. And so what you've done now is you've just freed up that capacity for other things and your homocysteine comes down, but also your sleep will get better in terms of your, your melatonin, serotonin levels, noradrenaline, all your, like a lot of your neurotransmitters rely on methyltransferase and, um, and people worry about Alzheimer's, like neurofibrillary tangles, one of the, that's hundred percent of neurofibrillary tangles are caused by methyltransferase defects, homocysteine issues. That's, that's what causes it. Um, Perfect. So, so those are the things that when you're looking at, and so for people looking at creatine, just a short little <laughs> blurb on it, yeah. it's your, it's your short backup battery in all your cells. Okay. So your cells generate ATP through the, and that's your, your energy um, and your mitochondria, but if, but they can't, your cells can't adapt instantly. So if you have to quickly run across the room, right, you're going to have a burst of energy in excess of what your, your, your mitochondria can keep up with. Yeah. And so what happens is the molecule called phosphocreatine. So creatine becomes phosphocreatine. Mm -hmm. Phosphocreatine donates a phosphate group to your ADP, put it back to ATP. So it yeah. basically is a really short backup battery, okay, when power goes out. And then it's, it's there for a very short burst of energy. And then once you stop, once you, once you reach the end of the wall, end of the hall and you stop, Okay, and then you're, you you yeah. restore your fossil creatine through your regular cycle. So it acts as this little energy buffer. 
So you're that's why you have a better performance when you take creatine. So your your you know your interval training, for example, right. is is better when you've got some creatine on board. Exactly. And but when we get older, become like you, your body starts making these choices of saying, I've got limited resources, where am I going to put it? Mm. And so you, you know, so elderly people lose muscle mass. A big yeah. reason for that is the body chooses to make less creatine um, because they need the methyltransferase for other systems. Wow, my mind is blown, totally blown, because yeah, I, I, I never connected those two dots before. Like this is just yeah. uh, well, Alzheimer's disease. Like there's like um, very high comorbidity with muscle wasting. Like if mm -hmm. you go to a, an old um, retirement home, you'll notice that some with Parkinson's or other things, they're up walking around. Alzheimer's patients are in wheelchairs. Yeah, okay, you'll notice that the Alzheimer's wards, the mobility in people with Alzheimer's is usually quite dramatically limited versus other diseases of that age group. So, yeah, this this is um, in, in something that you're fighting. I've, I've heard you talk about the reserve capacity of people goes down. So people like if we talk about young athletes now that are going having concussion after concussion, like rugby players or you know any of the contact sports, um, and, and they they appear to heal in a few weeks and they're but back they on don't. the field but they don't. they don't um and then years down the line they've lost that reserve capacity and then it comes to bite them in the ass when they get alzheimer's or dementia yeah, at 50. you very rarely recover from concussions what you do is your body adapts to it and works around it so and when when an athlete gets a return to play approval okay all they've done is they've adapted to the concussion the concussion the neural inflammation the white matter inflammation is still there. And so that's where proteomglia is involved. Like, so that's a big deal. Like you can prevent concussions, right? And then you can restore concussion. The, a concussion is like a bruise of the brain. But when you bruise your arm, you have really good circulatory system. Like you've got yeah. veins and arteries pumping and, you, and your, your stuff is moving in and out. And so when you need to get material from this part of your body to that part of your body, you can, you have the circulatory system. The brain isn't designed to take a punch. Okay. In it's, so it, it's, it's a contained it's a area. So you, system. Right. And so it's got to fix itself there in situ. And so when you get a concussion, that area is usually, you get an inflammatory component, it can't catch up. And this is where the plasmalogens come in, the omega-9, the proteome glia, and also mitochondrial support and acetylcysteine carnitine are very, very powerful at reducing concussion outcomes. Wow. And, you can, and if, you, if you take these omega-9 plasmalogens plus some mitochondrial support before a football game, you pretty well can't get a concussion. Because what happens like when you get when you when we do brain experiments where we look at um, brain damage, like we'll do an occlusion, for instance, a hypoxic occlusion for mm -hmm. ten minutes, five minutes. Yep. You don't see the brain damage till a week after. Wow. Okay. So the so infl inflammatory process takes that long to actually take. Well, then it feeds and it feeds and, and, and it gradually builds up because you've what you've done is you create this insult. And, and it's 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 a strong enough insult that it can't fix it, okay? And then the microglia of your body, which are designed to look for damage, they become very, very inflamed. And then that inflammation process creates more inflammation. And that's what autoimmune is, wow. essentially. So yeah, so if you, but if you can restore the membrane structure with, with plasmalogen precursors, then the microglia have no, there's no, no inflammation. Yeah. So the, the, it's exactly like MS. If you look at MS lesions on yeah. MRI. So they, yeah, they, then they grow over, over time. So, so plasmalogens are in that. So if we go into the chemistry of what this is, this is a phospholipid. This is something that we produce endogenously. Um, yeah. But as we get older, our ability to produce this and when we get knocks to the brain or we, we, we're starting to, so, and this is affecting all systems. So it's not the brain, the body, um, everywhere is, is affected by these, the mem membrane structures. I had Dr. Um, 
Bruce Lipton on the show a while ago, and he always talking about the, the membrane of the cell as being where the, the intelligence actually is, not so much the, 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 the DNA strand in the middle that we mm. always thought the intelligence was. You can take the DNA out and the cell will survive for a couple of months. You take the membrane away and it dies instantly. Um, and that the membrane is actually where it's all at. at. And the plasmalogens, they are in the membrane. So they're part of the membrane structure. Is it so? Is it this is like because when I'm like talking to clients about you know having good fats in their diet, um, and I'm trying to get them to swap out you know a good quality olive oil instead of their um deep fried turkey fried chicken, um, right. and why <laughs> because the we don't want those fats from the Kentucky fried chicken fat, the trans fats and things becoming the membranes of their cells. And then the, the integrity of those cells is, is, is not so good and stays around for a long time. Um, so is this the, the plasmalogens are the, the ultimate fat molecule, basically? It is. is it? And it's something you can't get them dietarily. You have to make them yourself. Right. They're, they're designed to be sacrificed, right? And they, so the last step in their manufacture creates a bond called a vinyl ether bond. So, but you're right. The, the final molecule is the phospholipid. It's part, and, and so phospholipids are what create membranes. And it's membranes that give your body the compartmentalization. It's what separates your heart from your lungs, from your brain. Yep. And then inside your cells, it separates your mitochondria from your proxosome, from this and that. And so it's like your house. Like you can you do things in your kitchen, in your bathroom. Right, it's a physical structure and things go in and out of them. And so when you change that membrane structure, it messes up a whole lot of things. Shoot, and, shoot. And, they're, and they're maintained in situ. Like your cells, each and every one of your trillion cells maintains its own membrane. Okay, it has its own bakery. It has its own machinery inside of it, right? And so it needs the building material to do that. And it'll get some of those building materials from the local circulatory system and some it makes itself. Plasmalogens, so plasmalogens do it part of the membrane and they are modifiers of that membrane because you have other phospholipids as well. And they're what gives you membrane certain fluidity. So the omega-3, the DHA plasmalogens, they're what allow your neurons to actually transmit. Okay, so nerve transmission in the synapse, like when like your switch on the wall, how, how does signal go from one neuron to the next neuron, okay? It's a biophysical process. Okay, you're not made of copper and wood. You're made of molecule of, of mm, biochemical okay. molecules. Yep. And that membrane on the on the synapse, the neurotransmitters are kind of contained in a little vesicle. Okay. And they're waiting for an action potential. When that happens, these vesicles translocate to the membrane, they fuse with the membrane and release their contents. That's mm -hmm. a physical process. It's 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 massive massive in scale okay the number of those little vesicles those, those neurotransmitter containing vesicles in your brain are about the same number as the number of sands in the hoover dam basically wow. huge and what's more important is that they have a hertz rate of between 50 and 100 which means between 50 and 100 times per second those vesicles are fusing coming back fusing and coming back so you think of the hoover the hoover dam Bursting in flames and, and reforming, bursting and reforming, 100 times a second. And, and this is what, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling, right? Yeah. And so, and that's not even counting your neuromuscular junction connections. So th this is what gives the human body its kind of quantum mechanical power. And that's only possible because of plasmalogens. You need 70, 75% of the lipid in that synapse has to be plasmalogen or that doesn't work. And so, and so your proxosomes make them. And the other part is this, they're very potent antioxidants. They, they neutralize hydrogen peroxide. So mm -hmm. that's why the last step in their manufacture gives them these special powers. But as soon as they hit the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, they, they burst. And so you can't really take plasmalogens dietarily. Your body must make them. But the good news is, is that it makes it, it from scratch. So you don't, there's, no, there's no vitamin or essential nutrient. Okay, you can make plasmalogens from butter fat. You can make plasmalogens from canola oil. You can make plasmalogens from anything that can be digested into a acetyl-CoA molecule, like cholesterol. Your body can make cholesterol from the simplest building block of, of nature. So, but the thing is we make them and the, the organelle that makes them 
is called the peroxisome. And it's very strange, it's one non-redundant system. And your peroxisomes are things that you, when you work out, you stimulate peroxisomes. Peroxisomes are, are so when people say, oh, you know, work out to lower your triglycerides. Well, if you're exercising and your exercise lowers your triglycerides, it's doing that by stimulating peroxisomes. Mm -hmm. It's turning peroxisomes on. And when you're fasting, the keto diet, the reason why the keto diet, one of the big reasons the keto and, and fasting is important is because it stimulates peroxisomes. Because when you're in the fasting state, it's these free fatty acids that your body uses to, to live on. And so peroxisomes digest free fatty acids. When you're in the fed state, you suppress your peroxisomes. And so as we get older, see, people think that we, we are genetically programmed to age, but we're not. We, what we do is we adapt to aging. We, the body gets more and more efficient as it gets older. It gets more and more, it's not, it's, it's, it, it, it tries to do less, it tries to do more with less. So wow. when you start, when, when you're, when you start walking less, well, he says, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to generate all this energy if you're not going to use it. Right. So it's going to start tuning things down. And so it, you, your body adapts to aging. So it learns to age. Okay. It's not programmed to age. Wow. It, it, it learns to it's age. It's a shift in paradigm thinking, isn't it? Right. And so, yeah, because it makes sense, right? So if you're, if you're working out, if you're, if you're, if you're moving less, you're eating less, you're doing these things less. And then it's, it's, um, it's the old, it's the old cliche, right? You, you can't teach a old dog new tricks, <laughs> but they're really, really good at the tricks that they know, right? They get better and better <laughs> at their, at their old more, Yeah, absolutely. And, and, it's, and it's no different than if you go to school, you know, you first get in your first week of class, you sit down in a, ta in a, in a chair, and for the rest of this semester, you, you, most people sit in the same damn chair or within a couple <laughs> or within a couple places of it because yes. it's easier. You don't want to think who wants to get in the room every day and say, I want to think from scratch yep. where I'm going to. Sit. So if you do, I wear say, well, the same clothes every day because I can't be right. bothered. <laughs> and it, so your body That's does easy. that. Your, your whole, as it ages, it it learns to, to do efficient. things more efficiently. And it doesn't it doesn't try as many risky things. Like when you're young, you try a whole bunch of stuff. And when you're old, you say, oh, did that, not gonna do it again. <laughs> and so, and so, the, so you, you, you learn. You learned. So you have to unlearn, like the, part of anti-aging is learning to be stupid again, right? Cause you have, <laughs> like, you, cause, the, cause the, it's, it's, it's this part of, of yeah. exactly. Like you have to be, you know, and, and, and you, have to have, you have to feel safe enough to do stupid things. Yeah. Right? As we get older, we become more conservative, more careful. We don't want we don't want to lose what we got and this and that. And so it's uh, and we think it's just one thing. Like it's not, you know, portrait of Dorian Gray type thing. Like you have to, <laughs> you know, anyway, so that's that's a yeah, that's a, so, well, so, so plasmalogens, yeah. So your body needs to make them. So you need to st stimulate them, but it's kind of like a vitamin D story. It's very, very it's theoretically possible, but practically impossible, okay, in terms of maintaining those high levels. So you and then when you're talking about, you get older. Yeah, and it's just a no-brainer. It's like a 30-year difference in lifespan based wow. on your past. Pattern. And so it's it's a big, big deal. And then it stimulates like the cholinergic system that co for cognition, but that's just a canary in the coal mine. It, it stimulates your pituitary gland, your hypothalamus, your thalamus. So your human growth hormone, and these things are all stimulated through the cholinergic innervation of your brain. And wow. as malogens, so those those are the same type of synapses that are that that degrade with cognition so and you were saying like with the plasmalogens that you produce at pro uh, progerm sciences you've got the the glia and the neuro and they have different so and then we've got things like fish oils which are also plasmalogens i believe so omega-3s no. are a type of no no they're not there's no plasmalogens in fish oil fish oil contains the fatty acid omega-3 fatty acids which is a piece of a plasmalogen, but a piece like fish oils are um, called triacyl glycerols. Uh -huh. Okay, plasmalogens are ether glycerols. So they're, okay, they're the is it like and a precursor ingredient part of it? Um, you can think of well, anything that's fat is going to be a precursor. Olive oil. Yeah. in your cupboard, for example. And think of it like a power cord with three outlets on it. And that's called a triacylglycerol. 
And in olive oil, you have oleic acid plugged in at all three positions. Fish oil is exactly the same thing, but instead of all of, instead of oleic acid, you get DHA plugged into the three different plugs. Or if you take canola oil, for example, it's going to be um, then oleic acid plugged in. Okay, or if you flax oil, which is your, your alpha linolenic, you're going to have alpha linolenic. So it's the same structure. So all those triglycerides, and that's what your also your body makes to store in its cells. Plasmalogens, instead of having that 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 first outlet. It's not, it's a fixed outlet. Okay. It's not, it's a, it's an ether bond. It's a different bond. And, mm -hmm. and you, you don't get that dietarily typically because it bursts apart. And right. that, that bond actually gets made in the human body. Your body makes it. And that's what makes a difference. So, I'm kind so of when they take your prodrome, your, your glia or your neuro formulations, what's yeah. actually happening in the body? Uh, so as you said, the digestion, you can't get through the digestion, but these, Right. These parts can. Oh, absolutely. So they're designed to be digested. Like the, the, you, you, I take mine all on a fasting stomach. So they're designed to enter the bloodstream. They're precursors. So they're like they, they're designed to go in situ. Mm -hmm. Think of um, L dopa for Parkinson's, right? Yeah. So L dopa is basically a supplement manufactured as a drug. Mm -hmm. It's a natural endogenous human intermediate. And it goes into the brain and it goes into the substantia nigra. And it, in the substantia nigra neurons, it gets converted to dopamine. Yep. And so that's why yep. it has this powerful effect. And we don't give dopamine because we can't, it won't make won't it there. go through. Yeah. So my plasmalogen precursors are designed the same way. They're designed, it's, the purpose is not to increase your blood levels. Your blood levels are after the fact. The purpose is the supplement, okay, it's a plasmalogen precursor, and it goes into each of your cells of your body. And allows that cell peroxisome to build the build the um, membrane plasmalogens for them. So it's designed to be made. Each cell make their own plasmalogens, and that's how you can target. So for an oligodendrocyte that's protecting your white matter, it wants to build an omega nine plasmalogen for its membrane. But when you're dealing with a neuron synapse, say in the nucleus basalis, you're you want a DHA or an omega three plasmalogen. So we and so the neuro has that prepackaged on it. So when it goes in, that cell can actually make the final plasmalogen. And then, then it has an ether bond, not a vinyl ether bond, so it's completely stable in acid. It gets absorbed and distributed. So you get this, and then you get this, um, it's kind of a two phase. The first phase is like the six to 12 hour kind of symptomatic phase. It actually, you really feel it. Like I love, I take my neuro, like I don't need it, but I technically, but it's uh, like I take three, four meals every day in the morning. You want to live to 200, so yes. Well, you know, it just feels good. It, 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 <laughs> yeah. it gives me energy, mental acuity during wow. the day. And it's, you know, it's, and I think it may, you know, obviously it's what reserve capacity we talked about. It's yeah. having that, um, so like it's reserve capacity is like having a savings account, right? You can technically say, you know what? In order to live, all I need is enough food and a little bit of shelter. Okay, and that's it. Well, that's a miserable existence, right? You still want to have a, you know, clothes and this and that, and, and so you, that is what excess reserve capacity allows you to live above basal existence. Yeah. So vitality. Biochem yeah. Biochem so vitality is that. Vitality is the little things. It's the little things that give you vitality. And um, and you need the, those extra cells to have that, and that's why you know vitamin supplements like are better than just food. Like you need good food, but when you take a B six or you take a you know a niacin, you're going to get that pharmacokinetic pulse, and it can it can drive it into your cells, and your cells will catch it, and then it'll keep it for a little while, and it'll come out again. Yeah. But so anyway, so let's and especially nowadays, like with the environment and the food, you know, like. It, we're producing on the same amount of land, you know, five times the crops that we were doing 70 years ago. So there's it, got to be something wrong in that equation. Yeah, do the, you, exactly. Do the math. I yeah. totally agree. It's, and then you pour on all the chemicals to make them look good and grow faster yeah. and, and the chickens grow faster with the hormones and the whatever, you know, like our food chain is a complete disaster. Um, 
in the environment that we live in, we're having to detox a hell of a lot more than our grandparents did. There's just hundreds of chemicals every day that we're exposed to. And this, I think, you know, like we don't probably know, or you may know, like why, you know, so many autism cases and so much more cancer and so much more, uh, all of these neurodegenerative uh, generative diseases, um, a concoction of bad foods, um, you know, environmental toxins. So anything that we can do to, to um, give ourselves a better chance in this sort of toxic soup that we're exposed to exactly. every day, I yeah. think. Uh, and this is why, you know, when people say to me, well, you don't need supplements. And I'm like, hey, you need good supplements, you know, and there's bad supplements out there and there are good supplements. And that is the difficult um, thing to try to work out which ones have been properly done and which ones haven't. And that's why I'm excited to, you know, talk to you today because I know, you know, after speaking with you for, a, for an hour here, you know that this stuff's being tested up the wazoo and and you can trust exactly. the science right you can't necessarily trust every brand that's on the supermarket shelf um this exactly. is why it, and yeah it's a reserve like this concept you don't need supplements like you you hit the nail on the head our environment is much more um inflammatory as a general rule um but the good news is that like we talk we, a lot of times we focus on the bad side right and say how much more of this no but there's a lot of people in inflammatory environments that aren't sick. Okay, so that, that tells you that there are antidotes to these things. Mm. And even when we talk about these longevity, since someone dies when they're 120, yeah. even a 120 year old who dies, their entire body doesn't go instantly out. Okay, so maybe their heart failed, but their lung was still working. Okay, Lungs, or they're, they're, you know, still had movement. So the, parts of their body weren't ready to die yet yeah so you so in theory so when we talk about this reserve capacity for supplements it's it's like it's it's creating a savings account yeah. um you can so yeah so this idea of of, of proactively prevention and intelligently and, yeah. you know in a targeted way because the other it, it is overwhelming um people get on a lot of supplements i focus on basically biochemical intermediates of the human body. Um, I don't get a lot into the herbal stuff other than say the curcumins, which yeah. are, but, you know, cause there's a whole bunch of stuff out there and uh, they all have a kernel of truth for the right person in the right place. Okay, so supplements can be drug-like for symptomatic improvement and supplements can be um, biochemical building blocks and they have different purposes. Mm -hmm. right like if you and so and they and and those different purposes have validity to them and so i try not to like these like i'm a farm boy personally from growing up and i can tell you like if you're the quality of one product crop to the next year after year the biggest challenge with some of these supplements of herbal extracts is the continuity of, of quality control mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the scalability of them this is exactly what you mentioned regarding our food supply right in terms of you know our bread it's also and so it's a, it's a challenge so it's and these things have a kernel in truth but so good doctors that understand this um they can apply some of this herbal medicine in, in extremely beneficial way yeah and so that, but it should be for purpose it's always fit for purpose and yeah. um and that is difficult for people, but, you know, like trying to create that reserve and be in that preventative space and having a mindset of always learning and being, taking ownership is what this whole show, show is about, is taking ownership of your, your own health and um, being proactive and being in that preventative space and trying to do the best you can and staying up on the latest knowledge so that yeah, you can logical. take advantage. You know, people don't, don't throw the logic that you've built your entire life away um, the, the scientific jargon sometimes intimidates people. Yeah. Um, but you should expect things to work. Um, and then don't be afraid of changing things up. Um, you know, spend enough time on one project long enough to know whether it succeeds or fail. But, you know, everyone is going to be have a little bit of a unique um, experience. You know, I, I do long fasting every day. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife can't. She needs smaller snacks. Um, and, but long as we do, you know, you, you have to find something that fits in your lifestyle that, um, you can sustain. 
Yeah. Because part of longevity is doing it forever. Yeah, and being able to sustain it. And this, I think, with mum and her uh, recovery journey is because I'm relentless. Like, you know, her every day is, you know, training, rehabilitation. It's, you know, it's a very set routine that she has. And we do it day in, day out. I don't care if it's a birthday. I don't care if it's Christmas. I don't care, whatever, yeah. you know. Um, and, and and that is, you know, like I've just been away for a conference. It's getting off topic, but I was yeah. speaking at a conference for a couple of days. And, you know, I came back and because she had, she didn't have the routine for two and a half days, um, I'm digging out the the consequences of that already, you know, like and that's just after two and a half days of not as much exercise, not as much water, not as much of the right things in the right mix, you know, um, and, and it's very, her reserve capacity is very small so I have to move her every hour of every day pretty much she needs to otherwise toxicity builds up in her brain and she won't be able to and I know that if I left her for a couple of weeks and went on holiday we'd be in major trouble because that reserve capacity is not there so now I'm quite excited I've had plasmologins in the mix during the cancer journey I was uncertain whether I should have them uh in there or not but I think you've um, allayed my, my concerns there, especially as we are gone through the kill phase. We're now in the rehabilitation, if you like, phase. Um, so putting some of those things, and I know there's, there's mum in the background, actually, yeah. <laughs> doing a little cameo as yeah. she does. Yeah. <laughs> She's brilliant at doing that. Um, <laughs> not my podcast. Um, but yeah, having that, that, trying to build up that reserve capacity, especially for someone who's had massive brain injuries. And this is something that's important, I think, for, for young athletes that are listening or people that have had multiple concussions and something. Don't wait for dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis to hit you 20 years down the track. Be proactive now and do something about it, you know? Absolutely. And we'll, we're, we're going to do some pretty, there's really good advanced MRI capabilities now. And so that's one of our next phases here is the basically rebuilding brains almost in a paint by number approach. And there's, wow. there's, there's ways of stimulating certain areas using MRI as a guiding tool. And so there's, 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 a, there's so much more that we can be doing. I wish I, could, I wish I could tap into your knowledge. For, for you. so we're getting there. <laughs> but, but people can, you know, the biggest thing is breaking this, uh, this inertia of futility, let's say, like they, they feel it's such an overwhelming task that they give up before they start. Yeah. And if you can isolate a situation, um, your human biochemistry is fixable. Okay. It's, it's, it's not, you know, you, these biomarkers that we measure, you have control over them. Yeah. Okay. You, you control them. You can put them in where they're supposed to be. And then it also creates a bit of calmingness because you can, you can find, get yourself in the right space and then keep yourself there. And then you still have the, the you know, short-term issues that you may deal with, but um, you know, get, make sure that the boogeyman isn't under the bed type of thing. Cause yeah. there's people who have these deficiencies. They have no idea. They know it. I know. And, uh, yeah. It's so sometimes it's actually really just basic things that if you just add it up, you could fix, you know, like vitamin D is one of my favorite topics yeah. or <laughs> magnesium or, you know, just some basic things that, Hey, we just need to go and check your, your levels. And, and that's not always easy because you don't always know that if it's in the serum, it's actually in the cell or, or, or whatever the case is. Yeah. But, you know, there's some basic things that, that can that can really help and heal. Um, Dr. Dan, you've been absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm very grateful for your time. And um, you've written this amazing book, Break, uh, Breaking Alzheimer's. Um, so I love people who are, you know, dealing with loved ones with Alzheimer's or if you want to just prevent it and you want to understand the science a little bit better to, to go and grab that. So we'll put the uh, the links in the, in the show notes and so on. Um, and where can people get the plasmalogens? Because we can get them now. And we can get them all over the, the planet because um, I've done it. So yeah, um, <laughs> so program, program.com. I think there's a, I think we've got a pretty good distributor in Australia and New Zealand there as well. Um, yeah. I might have to talk to your team blood, about that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and blood testing, I think there's capabilities there. And so, um, but yeah, go to program.com, no matter where you're in the world, we would direct you in the right direction to get what you need. Absolutely. Right. That's um, fantastic. And the blood testing is also available to actually find out yeah. what you've 
yeah what you're actually missing in things exactly um, because you kind of a collective story of that and then yeah and then drgoodnow.com has where is where all the educational content is yes so, so that's where i'll be doing more deep diving into myself personally i think that's where um, the clinical trial work goes on something like that. yeah because you've got clinical trials going all around the planet um, absolutely amazing thank you so so much i really appreciate your time today and uh, we'll put all those links in there and we'll great. see you again soon well thank you lisa have a great morning catch a nap sorry for keeping up all night and uh, <laughs> i'll talk to you soon okay.